Hey there and welcome back to Northwest Craftsman. Today we're going to be focusing on part two of a three-part series which is how to hand cut a mortise and tenon. Technically it's a single wedge mortise and tenon because we are going to be putting a wedge in it at the end but if you haven't seen part one of this video series it's going to be posted right in one of these two locations and that's going to be about hand cutting your mortise. Today we're going to be focusing on the tenon and then the next video is going to be focusing on the wedge and fitting the whole mortise and tenon together. All right we're going to be jumping straight into it. I hope you enjoy. Next up, we're going to be working on the tenon. One of the things that we need to look at is how far back does our tenon need to go? Now, if you're doing a normal fit tenon like I had uh, on my workbench itself, they don't need to go through that far, and I really just put them through a little bit for looks. But on this one, because we're going to have to be putting a wedge through this to drive the tenon even tighter, we're going to need to give it more space on the outside, and then we can trim off any of the excess once it's done. So the first step that we want to do is actually measure our mortise uh, measure the thickness or the through depth of your mortise. So we need to measure how big is this because that is the minimum depth we need to go on here. So this guy is one, two, three, looks like three and an eighth inches. So we're three and an eighth inches thick on this guy here, which means that we need to be going, and I'm just gonna pencil this in, we need to be going at least three and an eighth inches this far here but I would like to try and put about two inches on this side so that I have space to put a wedge without breaking off on this side. So if I'm gonna go three and an eighth, we've got 10 and an eighth, 11 and an eighth. This is about as far as I wanna be going with the actual uh, tenon. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark this guy off and we remember that we took a half inch off this side and then we need to make this edge right here uh, one inch across so that our chisel, where's our chisel? so that the chisel, uh, which is our one inch width, is going to fit nicely into the tenon. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this guy marked up and then we can start cutting it. So now that we got the length marked out over here, I wanna go ahead and mark out the half inch cutoffs because I'm gonna do the half inch cutoffs followed by the thin and narrow portion because that's a lot more difficult to keep straight. These guys should be easier to cut. So the other way that you can mark these is with your marking gauge and seeing as we have already marked off our tenon um, and that width is not going to do us any good, we can go ahead and undo this and then what we want to do is set this to a half inch and we can get roughly where it is here and then double check. So now just to confirm that we're actually measuring the same thing, it looks like we are exactly, I don't know if you guys can see that very well but it looks like we are exactly spot on with the mark that we had previously. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark the other side. So not only do you wanna mark the faces, but you also wanna mark the end right here because this is where you're gonna be starting your cut. After we got those guys cut off, the next step is to get the uh, one inch part of the tendon cut in. And so I wanna use my marking gauge as well to mark where this ought to sit. And then I'm gonna mark both of these and then cut this long slit off the front.
Okay, so one of the tricks that I learned the last time that I did this is I go just a hair wider than this because if I cut in at all or uh, there's any mistakes that I make while I'm sawing, I have no chance at correcting that. And I usually end up having to fine tune it a little bit with my chisel. So making it just a hair wide on either side, and I'm talking like a 32nd or less of an inch, allows you a little bit of space to uh, trim it down to exactly the size that you need in your tendon. If you're really good and consistent, you can do it exactly on point so that you're following your plan and following the pattern every time. Um, however, I still need a little bit of practice and work in order to be that consistent. There guys, you can see that is just about perfect right there, just a hair wide like we wanted. I'm gonna go ahead and mark the end grain and then move it over to my vise and get it cut. Okay, so when it comes to finishing your tendon, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Here's a small clip of what happens when you try to use your chisel to finish it off and you're going into the wood grain. The wood grain is coming up and out of it. You're gonna get a lot of this grain tear that you're seeing here. The alternative ways that you can finish it, not using a chisel, you can use a shoulder plane to get right up next to the shoulder of your tendon. That's actually what they're intended for. And what those planes have is a blade that sticks right up next to the edge. Now I don't actually own a shoulder plane, but I do own a rebate plane and I'm using it for a similar purpose. And this is what it looks like. As you're trimming it down, you wanna make sure that you don't go too far and you also wanna make sure you stay right up against the edge, otherwise you will start to carve a round up near that edge. So make sure you stay right up on your shoulder when you're doing that. Now the third way that you can do the finishing on your tenon is to use a poor man's, uh, what is it, a router plane. It's a poor man's router plane. If you haven't seen the video, go check it out here. Paul Sellers has a really good video on how to make it. And it's really nice for finishing off this entire surface all the way out here because most rebate planes, not rebate planes, most router planes won't allow you to get all the way out on a freestanding edge here because they need something to support them. But if you're using the poor man's router plane, you can put your two by four all the way across this face right here, come all the way out and plane all of this to exactly the depth that you need. I used that when I did these tenons because I had to come out about yay far on them and it's really difficult to try and get that consistent by hand. But using the poor man's router plane, you're able to get it all nice and smooth and consistent and you can leave it the same between all of your different pieces. So once you get it roughly down to the size that you need or roughly down to the thickness that you need, finish it off with the poor man's router plane and you're good to go. This is what that looks like. As the moniker suggests, the poor man router plane is something that you can do when you don't wanna spend a lot of money on a router plane. And actually it has the advantages, like I've said earlier, of being able to reach all the way out on the edge of something without needing to be supported on both sides. So the way that you're gonna do this is take the chisel size that you want and go just a hair under it by about an eighth of an inch, drill that hole through the two by four and then pound your chisel through there. Get it to be at about a 30 degree angle, doesn't have to be exact. And then when you're trying to get it in further, you're gonna go ahead and tap it on the back end here very, very gently. And when you wanna try and remove it, tap it right here and it will start to come out. Here's what the poor man router's plane looks like in action. The other thing that I would recommend if you are going to use the poor man's router plane is to make sure that it's set to the right depth on both sides at the very beginning and use this as your final mark for the sides of your workpiece rather than using the marking gauge. 
The reason I would do that is because this is going to be your final depth, not your marking gauge. So if you go through and you've got roughly where it needs to be with your marking gauge, set this to the right depth and then use it to provide the mark that you're actually going to cut against because that's where you know your final cut needs to be. And you can see it marks it just as nicely as the marking gauge does. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. Uh, some of the things that I didn't explicitly talk about in this episode are the couple of different ways that you can do things. When you're roughing the tenon, there's really two ways that you can do it. One way is to cut the actual slots off at 90 degrees like I did, where you cut all the material out at once. Uh, another alternate way that you can do it, which is more popular when you have a table saw on hand because of the number of cuts, is to actually do a whole bunch of parallel cuts all the way through the part, and then you knock it out and fine tune it with your chisel. I chose the first method. Um, it is a little bit more difficult because you have to keep your blade straighter longer, which requires a little bit more fine tuning in the end, but given the number of cuts that you need to make, it is simpler on that front. Uh, the second thing is when you're fine tuning the tenon itself, most of that fine tuning is going to happen when you do your dry fit, which is going to happen in the next video that we're going to be posting. Um, but there's three main ways that you can do it. One is with your chisel, which is pretty difficult. Uh, one of the things that I ran into, which you saw a little bit in this video, is coming into the grain and having the chisel control to work through, uh, work on the piece itself. Uh, it's probably one of the more difficult ways that you can do it. The second way is to use a shoulder plane and a shoulder plane is really great because you can get right up to the shoulder on your tenon itself and that's actually what they are intended for. I need to purchase myself a true shoulder plane, although a rebate plane can work in a pinch if you need to use that. Uh, the problem with a regular plane is that it doesn't come all the way up to your shoulder. You can't get right up on that 90 degree edge. Uh, and then the third way that you can do it is with a poor man's uh, router plane. And Paul Sellers has a great video on this. I posted a little bit earlier, but you can go ahead and find it here in one of these two locations. I'm still trying to get used to my new camera to see where they're going to pop up. Uh, but you can go and find it on Paul Sellers' channel. Uh, he's got a lot of really great content. I highly recommend you checking him out, subscribing to him if you get a chance. Um, a lot of the stuff that I am learning is coming from him and from his channel. So go ahead and check it out. Uh, because I don't have a shoulder plane, I am actually a huge proponent of the poor man's rebate plane. And so that rebate plane, poor man's router plane. And that is something that I am going to be using on a more regular basis because of how consistent it is. At any rate, thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you like this content, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more of this content on the channel, go ahead and hit subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you get notified when new content is released. And we also have an Instagram and a Facebook, so go ahead and follow us over there. And we can't wait to see you for the next one. All right. Thanks, you guys. Have a good one. Bye.